Welcome to today's webinar, Private versus Public Networks for Smart Grid Communications. My name is Pam Cannon, and I'm the Director of Marketing for Power Products and Power Systems. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. All participant audio will be muted during the event. If you would like to ask a question during the event, please use the question box on the GoToWebinar panel. We will try to answer your questions during the event. Today's webinar is being recorded. A link to the recording will be emailed to you following today's event. Feel free to forward the link to people you know who could benefit from the presentation. Before we go to our feature presentation, I wanted to introduce the 2013 ABB Automation and Power World event. This year's event will be held March 25th through the 28th at the Orange County Convention Center in Orlando, Florida. Automation and Power World is the premier event for engineers and business leaders designed so you can experience and learn the latest in automation and power technology and how it can benefit the profitability of your business. This mega event will include over 400 educational workshops on topics that are vital to the success of your business. Today's webinar will give you an example of the type of practical training you'll experience at the event. You can earn PDH and CEU credits and spend some valuable networking time with peers. This event will also feature a technology and solutions center with over 130,000 square feet of exhibits with nearly 100 tons of electrical gear and hundreds of experts ready to answer any of your questions and share the future of automation and power solutions. We're expecting over 4,000 attendees at the event, making it an excellent opportunity for face-to-face -face sharing of ideas and a chance to get reacquainted with old friends and colleagues. Here are just a few of the examples of the educational workshops developed for all audiences, roles, industries, and experience levels. Be sure to bring your questions and get them answered by our expert panel of presenters. Here are some comments from past attendees. I'll be back at the end of today's presentation with more information about ABB's Automation and Power World Conference. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Adam Guglielmo. He is the Director of Business Development for ABB Wireless Communication Systems, which is formerly Tropos Network. He is based in Raleigh, North Carolina and has 14 years of experience in the telecommunications industry in product management, marketing, sales, and business development. And before joining ABB, he spent over seven years at Juniper Networks in a variety of roles. And with that, I will turn it over to Adam. Thank you, Pam. Um, so today's topic, as Pam mentioned, is uh, private versus public networks for smart grid. The intent here today uh, uh, is really not so much about proclaiming one approach the winner and saying it should always be the choice. In certain situations, public networks may work best, while in others, private are going to make more sense. And in some cases, a hybrid of the two uh, is going to be the best solution. We want to give you a better view of the where and the why in terms of these options. So as utilities seek to deploy various applications in their networks, making the grid more intelligent, they need communications to tie things together. In evaluating communications, one of the key questions that comes up is this one of public versus private. Some utilities take the approach of why reinvent the wheel when we can leverage what the wireless carriers have done. We can pay for what we need as a service and buy more later if we need it. Uh, our initial applications don't even require that much by way of performance. Uh, and the carriers, of course, are fostering this approach with plans, service plans, and support aimed at utilities. However, other utilities are taking the approach that building their own network makes more sense unless the economics dictate otherwise. Several reasons exist for going this route, but it usually comes down to one factor, and that's control. Control over a number of different factors here, including things like reliability, availability, performance, security, and coverage. These are just seen as necessary by the utilities and by the, uh, those responsible for communications uh, within those utilities. We'll dig into some specifics around those factors uh, as we go through the discussion here today. But to paraphrase uh, 
the executive mindset here. It's, it's really that when there's a major event, and I most need my communications, I don't want to be competing with everyone who just grabbed their iPhone to call their mother. So as I said up front, and as I, as I just framed the opposing views, the answer is it depends. Okay? Different situations call for different solutions. But what I want to make sure you all walk away with today is a sense of what the criteria should be, and more specifically, what the criteria should be in the distribution area network. I'm going to dive more deeply into some of these factors coming up again. But there are a couple that I want to look, up, look at up front and then maybe we'll touch on them more as we go along. The first of these is topography and device density. In other words, is it an urban or a suburban area? Is it small towns? Is it hilly and tree-filled? Or is it wide open plains? Are we looking at single devices spread miles apart, or hundreds or even thousands of devices to be connected in a relatively small area? These factors may slant the decision in one direction or another. A second factor here is what are the goals of the utility in this project? Are they looking to solve an immediate problem only? Is uh, advanced metering in, uh, support? Or, or is the utility beginning a long-term modernization project and so wants a network that can grow over time and has a lifespan consistent with other utility field assets. In terms of applications and the role they play in selecting communications, we see a more or less natural division based on which portion of the, ne of the utility network you're talking about. On the one end, you've got your primary substations, your high voltage sites, your generation facilities. These have high-end requirements in terms of the amount of data, the performance requirements, the reliability. They're also lower in number. And generally, they're going to be served by fiber or, depending on location, by microwave. On the other end, you've got your metering infrastructure. Here you've got lots of devices, but you've got lower bandwidth requirements. You've got lower reliability and availability requirements got less strict latency requirements as well. Typically, these are going to be served by lower bandwidth connections. Uh, sometimes they're aggregated in the field and then backhauled uh, over a distribution area network, or in other cases, they're going to be brought straight back from the neighborhood aggregation points for metering. In the middle area, what's in between is the distribution network and all the devices that are used to control, monitor, and manage it. This is really the focus of today's discussion and where all the debate is centered. There's a great variance here in application requirements, but they can be extremely demanding. There's a fairly large number of devices, and there's a lot of technologies in the mix. More and more, of, there's more and more projects here, uh, and more and more holistic planning, too. In large part, this next slide is just a visual representation of what we just discussed. You've got your advanced metering infrastructure, and even beyond that, your home area networks on the bottom of the slide. You've got the core on the top, and in the middle, again, you've got the distribution or field area network. Here we have the ABB Tropos solution covering this portion. It's worth noting that this solution can connect to the distribution endpoints directly, and connect to metering aggregation points. One other key point to make here is this notion of the utility communications infrastructure as a network of networks. Similar to enterprise or even consumer broadband networks, this means things tend to be arranged hierarchically with lots of devices or consumers on one end, uh, and then in the middle you have an aggregation layer, possibly two, and then this layer bridges your core and your end customers connects different clusters of end users, and also connects additional infrastructure. With utility networks, the latter takes on greater importance because communications is supporting the electrical distribution network. Again, there are different requirements at each layer, and this is important because as some solutions try to edge up from metering and others try to bypass the distribution area aggregation, 
an interconnectivity function, they may miss some requirements in terms of performance, latency, or availability. Here's just another way of visualizing how the requirements of the different portions of the network and their applications dictate which types of solutions get applied. There's not much additional to point out here except sensitivity, which was probably pretty intuitive anyway. And then as the number of devices goes up here, while at the same time performance requirements go down, there's going to be an emphasis on lower cost, higher more highly productized solutions. Whereas when you're dealing with a low number of highly engineered sites with specific requirements, cost is going to be less of an issue and custom solutions are going to be more the norm. And then in the middle, again the distribution area, you're going to find a mix of requirements but trending toward a need for ones which can support pretty demanding requirements for performance while being at least somewhat productized in terms of cost uh, and uh, the speed of deployment. Okay. So what are the considerations then between public and private solutions in the distribution area applications? Why do private networks start to make more sense when you look at the requirements or, or the other way around? Comparing a few of these factors side by side, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but we'll start with availability meaning do I have access to the network resource when I need it. Private's generally going to be better here. It's yours, you control the design, you manage the load, etc. With public, you're talking about a shared resource. And even with so-called private networks, carriers may ultimately need more spectrum in order to guarantee the machine-to-machine -machine, uh, parameters that are required. With reliability, Private depends on design to some degree, but can be as high as five nines of reliability, meaning you have about five minutes of unplanned downtime per year. You can build in redundancy and resiliency as part of this to meet your needs. Compare that, compare that with public, where basically you get what you get. You cannot, it's difficult to get an SLA, or you may not even be able to get an SLA uh, with some of the public carriers. Uh, and this includes their business class offers, what their machine-to-machine -machine services are based on. Even if you could, they have force majeure clauses in their contract, which means that when you need the network most, it may not be there, and there's really no recourse if it isn't. In terms of bandwidth, it really depends on which private network technology you're discussing. With 900 megahertz radios, for example, uh, it can be, you know, roughly around 100 kilobits per second. With private mesh, like the ABB Tropo solution, uh, you can be as high as in the 10, 10 to 20 megabit uh, per second range. Uh, and eventually, uh, when the latest 802.11 uh, standards get applied fully to the mesh, you're looking at even higher rates. LTE, uh, the, the latest public solution, is in that 10 to 20 megabit uh, range as well. Uh, skewing up probably a little bit lower uh, uh, than, than 10 to 20, maybe more 5 to 12. Uh, in terms of latency, uh, it's really lower on the private side. Again, uh, within the, uh, this is really within the owner's control, uh, and this is especially critical with applications like feeder protection. Um, with those applications, public is really not going to be a fit because their latency uh, their performance in terms of latency really isn't uh, what it needs to be for those applications. With quality of service, uh, with private, it's more within your control. Again, with public, you, you may have it, but it's going to be within prescribed limits, and availability is also going to be up to the carrier. Uh, with security, uh, again, with private, it's IP-based, uh, at least with, with mesh solutions, uh, and it relies on well-tested standards. Um, it's based on security based on security mechanisms that are built in uh, and, if, and again you control. Uh, these solutions are NERC SIP compliant, uh, NIST compliant, uh, and FIPS compliant. With public providers you get a secure end-to-end -end pipe but compliance, forensics, etc. will require cooperation uh, and may be ultimately more difficult in practice. 
in terms of the cost analysis, it really boils down to a CapEx versus OpEx debate. Public has a lower cost entry point, or it may, uh, but you end up with a monthly bill that could grow over time as you add capacity or services. For example, security services like device or application layer security, managed security services, additional quality of service, as I just touched on, uh, additional queues, etc. So even if you start at the low end of things uh, in terms of this uh, graph that we have here with a public network solution, you could end up moving up the ladder over time. With private networks, and again, we're using ourselves here uh, since we have the data, your cost is going to be higher up front, typically, uh, but over time your ongoing costs remain predictable and lower, basically flat. So over time, and as you add devices, the total cost of your network becomes lower. What's more, you know that this is an investment that will hold up over time. Okay. We mentioned the issue of control in public versus private earlier and throughout. But a couple of dimensions more I'd like to touch on. There are a couple dimensions more that I'd like to touch on here. We already hit on the issues uh, with the SLA and force majeure, but another control issue is with regard to the technology lifecycle. Here, just think about what happened uh, when the wireless carriers moved from 3G to 4G. To get access to the new features and services on 4G networks, you had to get a new device. The same will be true with cellular devices you deploy for communications in the utility network. Their refresh cycles have typically been somewhat short of what utilities are used to in terms of equipment lifecycle. And again, if you want the latest features when they become available with that next generation technology, you're going to have to upgrade your communications equipment. Another consideration uh, in terms of control, uh, and specifically with distribution area networks uh, and communications, is coverage. Sometimes utility assets are not within the cellular coverage area. When they're not, it might be possible for the public wireless carrier to hang a repeater, but there will likely be a capital charge associated with that. With private networks, the, the utility can design from the ground up basically to cover uh, their footprint. So essentially, they're custom built. Uh, in terms of you know, what the research shows. The research tends to support the growth of wireless for smart grid over time in general. Uh, here in North, here for North America, and if anything, there might be more wireless globally, right? Uh, where there's not as many terrestrial networks uh, typically uh, deployed. This also, this slide also highlights that despite the emergence of LTE and whatever's next, Private networks will continue to predominate, and it's the issues of control, the issues of meeting the application requirements that are really going to drive utilities to going with private networks, um, particularly applications outside uh, of metering. Okay. This, the same uh, points are basically reinforced uh, by data from surveys of utility operators. Uh, they tend to overwhelmingly favor private networks when, when asked. And again, it's the issues of control uh, and which technologies are the best fit or, or best fit the needs uh, of the applications that are driving this, this uh, preference. Before closing, uh, I just wanted to go through a couple of specific examples. Uh, that we've seen where utilities evaluated uh, our solution, specifically the Tropos broadband mesh, versus public wi wireless carrier options, and ultimately went with the private solution. The first of these uh, was Detroit Edison, which started off as a metering application, specifically backhaul for metering, where cellular was tried and simply wasn't providing uh, reliable enough connectivity. There were outages in the winter time. There was poor coverage in some parts of the network, uh, et cetera. Detroit Edison has now deployed a properly engineered private network, which has solved these issues. 
It's also allowing them to go beyond the initial applications and start exploring distribution automation and mobile workforce. Uh, and as they, dis as, as they explore things like mobile workforce, uh, it should be noted that there's, there's no monthly data charge uh, for each one of those mobile workers who's accessing uh, the data that they need in the field. A second example uh, is with Avista uh, up in Washington State. Avista evaluated both public uh, and private network options. The private network option uh, ended up being the best because it best aligned with their long-term transformational goals. Uh, particularly, uh, it was the redundancy in the broadband mesh uh, and in the management of that network uh, that was attractive to Avista. Basically, when they looked at the cumulative requirements of all the applications they were looking to deploy in terms of latency, in terms of bandwidth, uh, in terms of coverage and reliability, the private network uh, really just made more sense for them. Just wanted to hit on a couple of issues internationally. Up to now, we've really been talking about uh, factors that apply most specifically to the, to the U.S. or to the North American market. Uh, but I wanted to hit on a couple of international issues as well. Um, the biggest differences uh, when we look uh, around, around the world are, are with spectrum availability uh, and, and with limits on transmission power uh, for private network solutions. In the case of the Trobos ABB solution, we use the 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz frequency ranges. Uh, in the U.S. and many other markets, these are unlicensed and free to use. But in some markets, they are controlled by licensing, and in a few, uh, they're actually barred completely. Um, that isn't very common, but, but it does exist out there. Uh, getting licenses where licenses are required obviously adds to the cost, but much of the, uh, much of the, the rest of the evaluation criteria really remains the same. Uh, in, in those cases. With transmission power regulations, and this is something that, that comes into play particularly uh, in, in Europe, uh, this is going to impact the architecture of the network, meaning, uh, and again, I'm talking specifically about, about the broadband mesh here, uh, it means more nodes are going to be required uh, in certain markets. Again, many of the issues of control and application support would remain the same, but the economics uh, in those cases would, would certainly be affected. Okay. It's also true that globally um, cellular coverage uh, it tends to be uh, very good. Um, in those uh, around the world, uh, LTE isn't as broadly deployed at this point um, as it is in the US, uh, but in general cellular coverage is readily available and it's available at price points uh, that are pretty similar uh, to what we find here in the United States. So um, again, there's going to be there's going to be an evaluation, and the evaluation is going to be somewhat different uh, in international markets than it is here in the U.S. But a lot, again, a lot of the underlying factors uh, remain the same. Okay. So one international example. Um, one customer uh, that, that, that we have in a, in a foreign market in the, in the UAE is the Abu Dhabi Water and Electric Authority. Uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz frequency re uh, band requires a license to operate in. So uh, Adwia, uh, the utility there, had to get a nationwide license in order to use uh, our particular private network solution to support uh, their grid modernization project. Again, the issues of control, of supporting the aggregate needs uh, of the network and the applications on the network were such that it was still attractive enough for them to do that and it overcame the, uh, the economic uh, drag maybe that that had on the private mesh solution. Uh, and so they went, they went ahead with that solution anyway over a, uh, a cellular solution, a public solution. So to close, I just want to emphasize uh, one last time 
uh, that cellular is a good fit for certain applications and use cases. We outline uh, some of those uh, reasons here. Um, in some cases, again, a mix of technologies is going to make the most sense uh, for the utility. However, when utilities plan and begin doing transformational projects for grid modernization, and they evaluate solution, this, which solutions uh, best meet their long-term needs in the majority of situations, they're preferring private network solutions for the reasons that we've outlined here today. It's about, again, it's really about control and it's about specific performance with certain applications. And it's about the aggregate or the cumulative support for all those smart grid applications. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. That was very informative. Um, again, we're going to open this time up for questions. If you would like to go ahead and type your questions into the panel on the GoToWebinar screen on the right of your monitor, um, we would be happy to take your questions. And uh, Bert, I think we already have some questions if you'd like to go ahead and ask those. Uh, yes, we do. <clears throat> so uh, first question, Adam, is uh, are there any communication systems that are robust enough to use for both AMI and uh, distribution automation devices? Uh, yes, uh, Bert, there are. So broad, broadband mesh specifically being one of those uh, solutions. It, again, as we, as we went through in the presentation, uh, from a bandwidth perspective, certainly, um, you know, it's, it, it's providing between 10 and 20 megabits when it's properly engineered of throughput. From a latency perspective, we're talking about uh, sub millisecond per hop uh, performance uh, in the links. And so over an entire uh, feeder, we can provide uh, latency uh, performance that meets with the needs uh, of the utilities for those uh, applications like feeder protection. OK. Um. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, um, a few, um, uh, some uh, questions, some comments here. Uh, this has come up several times, so let me just answer it. Um, the uh, presentations will be, <coughs> the presentation will be available for download. Um, at the, uh, after the webinar, all of the registrants are going to receive a thank you email and that will contain a link that will allow everybody to download the slides. Um, let's see, moving on to the next question here. Um, ABB is sunsetting um, uh, 2G for 3G, <clears throat> which will obsolete many endpoints. Um, uh, battery and cost issues may limit moves to, to 3G. Uh, what uh, comments would you have about that, Adam? So it was, I, I, I guess the comment that I would have there is in terms of uh, backup power and being able to uh, provide power, um, you should look for solutions that have internal battery backup uh, or, or certainly some form of battery backup to be able to, to ensure that uh, your communications remains up uh, uh, even when there's an outage. Uh, obviously, specific applications, that's going to be critical. Uh, and it's going to be a, a baseline requirement for those applications. And again, I'm talking about uh, specifically feeder protection there. Uh, the Tropo solutions uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the head end side or on the substation side where we typically uh, position one of our gateways have internal battery backup. Uh, and on the units that we would position down the feeder line or out across the distribution area, uh, we do have battery backup solutions available uh, that can be mounted with the radios themselves. Okay, um, another question here. Uh, what is the projected life of Tropos equipment in the field environment given the fact that electronics has a uh, limited lifetime degraded by operating temperature extremes? Um, uh, Adam, you want to address that? Sure. The, the Tropos... Uh, I'll start off with a general comment there, which is that the Tropos equipment uh, was engineered from the get-go uh, to be operated outdoors. Um, so that includes both our, uh, our design in terms of our radio meshing technology, and it also includes our design from a, a physical, uh, physical perspective. 
So the cases that uh, that that uh, contain our radios are just are are completely ruggedized. Uh, you know, we can we can uh, operate in very extreme temperatures. Um, you know, we can basically survive a direct lightning strike, and we actually have documented cases uh, where we had a unit uh, that was that was hit by a lightning strike, and the antenna was was split or burst, but the unit itself was otherwise okay. Uh, and so all that really contributes uh, to a very high uh, mean time between failure or before failure uh, with our devices. I've seen different numbers thrown around uh, internally, but it's, I think it's pretty safe to say, Bert, uh, somewhere north of 10 years, certainly. Uh, I've seen 15 years also put out there and even as high as uh, you know, 20 or 30 years out there for our systems. So it's a good bit longer uh, than what you're seeing uh, with the public where you may be forced to migrate uh, in, in a more short period. Um, yeah, and uh, if, if I could just add a point there, you know, we've had uh, Tropos units deployed in the field since certainly there's been stuff in continuous operation from 2004, maybe even earlier. And, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, typical electronics have a bathtub uh, curve for uh, failures where you get, you know, high infant mortality, then the failure rate's very low for the length of the life cycle, and that starts to go up again at the end. And, uh, you know, so far we haven't seen any evidence that we're starting to get up to the, the late end of the bathtub curve. Um, you know, it's hard to, to say, uh, you know, that we have a 15-year life when we don't have anything installed in the field for that uh, right. long, but evidence is that is that uh, you know we can reach a kind of a long lifetime with that. Um, so, uh, Adam, you might want to back up a few slides mm -hmm. because there is a question here about the price point for cellular data that would uh, make it more um, attractive. And I think that you had a slide a little bit earlier that. Um, Talks about the um, uh, about the um, life cycle cost for cellular at various um, monthly subscription rates versus mm -hmm. um, uh, putting in a private network solution. Okay, I don't have control of the presentation at this point, so if we could Pam, if you could give me that back real quick. Yeah, that's the one right there, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that more, Adam. Okay, so really, what we're showing here uh, is is the uh, as the number of devices uh, per feeder goes up, um, obviously your and and the price goes up based on the price plan that the cellular carrier is giving you. Uh, the cost of uh, your network over time uh, goes up, whereas the tropos because you're continuing to pay uh, those monthly rates, right? Whereas a, a private network like the Tropos solution uh, would remain relatively flat uh, over that same period. Obviously, there's going to be some uh, internal operating cost associated with, with uh, running that network, uh, but it's not going to be the same as what you would see uh, with the cellular, where you're just going to have that ongoing uh, regular monthly cost which, if anything, is going to go up over time, again, as you add additional services, uh, as your data needs increase, uh, as you look for higher reliability or more quality of service, uh, et cetera. And so that's why we kind of have those different bands uh, in terms of the cost uh, for, for public options. And then <clears throat> another question from the same <clears throat> asker. Um, Uh, during a force majeure event that takes out a public network, does your model assume uh, no harm uh, to the, uh, the private network? So would you like to expand a little bit upon some of the uh, issues that public versus private networks face during force majeure type events? Yeah, sure. So obviously, with a, with a force, with a, when there's a force majeure event, so specifically here we're talking about things like a hurricane or a major winter storm, 
not only do those have um, uh, the, the, the capability of taking down uh, portions of the utility network uh, uh, and the communications uh, systems that are linking uh, assets within that utility network, um, but when those things happen, right, uh, cellular carriers uh, typically get get more uh, use uh, on their networks, uh, and so what happens there is their availability tends to uh, de decrease uh, during those moments. Uh, so, in in addition to the the potential for them actually losing the ability to provide service, um, their ability to provide service even when they're up is decreased, right? And so the, the SLAs. Uh, with the cellular carriers during those time, because they're limited or in many cases un or, or, or even unavailable, um, you're not going to have any recourse. The model doesn't really take that uh, into account, uh, but then the difference between that uh, and the private network side is with the private networks, you have the ability uh, to engineer uh, additional redundancy, uh, additional reliability, uh, and as I mentioned before, you can put battery backup uh, in with certain solutions, uh, notably the, the ABB Tropos uh, uh, mesh solution. So you have a greater uh, ability to control uh, whether your network stays up during those, tor during those types of events. And obviously that's when you're going to want uh, your network the most, or one of the times when you're going to want your network the most. Okay, and then um Another question here is, how does your MESH solution compare with star topology solutions? And I assume that by star topology solutions, what the person asking the question is, is really talking about is point to multipoint uh, type of solutions versus MESH solutions. Right. Um, so again, it's, it's really, uh, there's a couple different things there. One of them is, is going to be uh, in terms of redundancy and your ability to engineer additional uh, redundancy uh, and reliability uh, because of that into your network. Um, with a star topology, uh, typically you're going to have a point in the middle of that network where a lot of the points around it are connecting back into. Um, if something happens to that point in the middle, all of the assets that are connecting back into that central point uh, are uh, going to be left without communications. Typically also, that central point is the most expensive uh, part to deploy uh, and to maintain uh, within your network. Um, so, you know, when you're engineering your network, it's possible that you could build uh, multiple points like that, but it's going to be a lot more expensive, uh, and so the chances that you do that are probably somewhat less. Um, also, in terms of performance, uh, in terms of uh, latency, et cetera, uh, and, and bandwidth available, with a mesh network uh, like the Tropo, like the ABB Tropos solution, uh, our network is is constantly reevaluating uh, what are the most efficient paths uh, through the network uh, and back to the, your your core network uh, resource, uh, so that uh, if if one uh, if a path if what's typically being used or what what is being used at one point uh, is the most efficient path uh, and the connectivity to that one point goes down, uh, the network will automatically reconfigure itself to, reuse, to, to use a different uh, exit point from that network uh, uh, and, and continue to, to supply connectivity uh, and continue to, to, uh, to do so fairly efficiently w without really missing a beat. So um, <clears throat> the <clears throat> there are a, a number of questions and comments here that um, uh, basically are uh, expressing a uh, sense that um, we've been in somewhat unfair to the cellular carriers and some of our um, uh, comparisons here. So I want to mm -hmm. kind of summarize uh, and, and ask two questions that will maybe address some of this. Um, so first of all, um, when would you want to use a cellular solution? When would a public network solution be a better choice for utility than a private network solution? Um, a, a public network solution uh, is going to be well, maybe a better uh, choice for a utility uh, in cases where 
a, me uh, a mesh wouldn't necessarily make sense. So a mesh is going to make the most sense where you have a, a, a fairly dense uh, distribution of devices, uh, and you it makes sense to provide uh, coverage as well as connectivity. Uh, and, and, and the utility, in fact, is looking for coverage as well as connectivity. And so what I mean by coverage is sort of providing an umbrella uh, over an area uh, of broadband connectivity uh, through which you can connect a number of different devices. Uh, and those devices can be uh, specifically grid assets uh, like relays and, and various other uh, uh, points like RTUs, uh, or they could be a mobile worker. Right, who was who was moving throughout that territory and needed uh, broadband coverage. Um, where cellular tends to come out better is in less dense areas where the cost of providing a, a mesh network isn't necessarily going to uh, work as make as much economic sense. Uh, so in those cases where cellular coverage exists, it may make sense to put a single point out there uh, with uh, with a cellular uh, modem attached to it. Uh, similarly, in some cases, you're going to have clusters of devices that are apart from uh, uh, the bulk of your network. Uh, and in, in, in some cases, those are going to be reachable by cellular networks. Uh, in, those, in those areas, it may make sense to use uh, cellular 3G or 4G uh, backhaul from those clusters that are, that are, that are uh, isolated from the, from the rest of the grid. Uh, to connect them back to the grid. Uh, so you may have a mesh out being connected by those clusters, uh, being connected by LTE in those cases, being backhauled by LTE in those cases. But within the little cluster that's out there, you may actually have a small mesh uh, network that's uh, separate uh, from, the re from the rest of the grid. And then um, <clears throat> the, the second uh, question I wanted to ask, which is kind of summarizing the um, uh, a point that a few of the people have raised in the questions is <clears throat> the uh, rates for cellular for very low bandwidth applications are actually very low, in fact much lower than the uh, numbers we're showing um, on the uh, chart that's uh, uh, up uh, at the moment. Um, but I think that leads to the, the question of um, why do you need broadband for, say, for example, feeder applications. Um, because clearly, if, uh, if uh, you only require an AeroVan solution uh, and you can get a cellular connection for uh, less than a dollar a month, um, it, it, you know, other considerations may get you to go toward uh, public, or I'm sorry, toward private, but uh, economics are not like, uh, likely to. Um, what really drives people uh, in utilities to want to have a higher bandwidth solution up uh, in the uh, feeders uh, so that um, uh, it uh, gets to the point where the, the data transfer uh, is not eligible for the, the really low cost of your connections? Yeah, and I, I, I think the, uh, the, we touched on this a couple of times. Um, in the presentation, and I think the the, the issue the uh, the explanation for this is really about uh, you know what is the what is the utility looking to do? Is the utility looking to solve uh, a single you know short term problem, uh, or is the utility really engaging in a long term kind of strategic uh, rethink of what they want to do in terms of smart grid? Um, if they're looking to do a single application. Yeah, and uh, d depending on the application, a low bandwidth solution uh, may make sense. And yeah, the rates there, that's another use case uh, where cellular might make uh, more sense if you're, if you're looking at a single application or a couple of applications in isolation that don't have particularly high requirements. But when you look at all the different applications that utilities are looking to deploy uh, within their distribution area network, uh, and, and possibly connecting things beyond their distribution area network, as in the case of backhauling uh, metering data. Uh, the cumulative requirements of all those applications add up to something uh, which we feel it, 
is, is, is much harder for a cellular solution to support, uh, particularly when you look at uh, uh, matters of latency, when you look at matters of aggregate bandwidth, when you look at security, uh, when you look at reliability. Um, those things are much harder. And when you look at coverage, um, it, it's much harder for the cellular uh, solutions to kind of meet up with all those requirements when you look at things in the aggregate. And uh, another question here is, um, what kind of uh, battery backup uh, lifetime uh, can uh, the um, uh, private network uh, solutions support? And we probably ought to address both internal and external battery backup options when we talk about that. Um, so that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know about the total lifetime of, of those batteries, but in terms of uh, you know how long they can provide power during an outage, um, we have uh, a number of different options. I think the typical option, uh, and Bert, I don't have the, the data sheet in front of me here, but it's it's a six to eight hour uh, typically is what we're looking at. Uh, with for the, um, yeah, for the integrated. Right. Um, and then we have the external solutions that you can really uh, engineer to be, you know, much longer times. I don't want to say as long as you want because obviously there are both technical and economic limits, but certainly for much longer uh, right. periods of time if you go with the external solution. Right. And that really takes care of all the questions I have in my queue. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, Adam. I think those are some really good questions. Um, if this topic did interest you, um, I'd like to encourage you to take a look at our Automation and Power World event. Um, the following are some of the courses that we'll be offering related to today's topic um, at the event uh, in March. <clears throat> Uh, the content you heard in today's webinar is just an example of the training sessions that will be offered in the conference at March. Here are some statistics on the powerful training events that we are assembling this year. We also have plenty of registration options for this year's event, um, so, and there's even a free day, one day courtesy registration path um, that you could take advantage of, so we appreciate you considering attending the event. <coughs> If those aren't reasons enough to attend this year's event, we have 10 more reasons why you don't want to miss. Those reasons is Orlando's a beautiful place. Here's the URL for registering for the event. Um, at this URL, you can also find links to the conference brochure and additional free webinars like the one that you saw today. We look forward to seeing you at the conference in March, and thank you very much for attending today's webinar. When we close the screen, a short survey of today's event uh, will come up, and we appreciate your feedback and comments. Thanks, and have a great day, guys.